Hello everyone, and welcome to another Warcry Battle Report. Today, a host of Sylvaneth Dryads will attempt to drive out a warband of Gobos from their woods. As such, we won't be playing with the usual Warcry terrain today, but a set from Dungeons & Lasers. Now, just to clarify, I'm not affiliated with them or anything, but I do really like their stuff. So there's a good chance I'll be showing off more Dungeons & Lasers stuff on the channel. Now with that said, let's introduce the warbands, draw some cards, and get this battle report going. Now starting with the Gloomspite Gitz's Hammer Squad, they have one Rockgut Trogoth, or just the good old trolls I like to refer to them, together with two shooters. Up next the Dagger Squad will contain the warband's leader, the Loon Boss, together with three Stabbers with Poken Sticks. And lastly for the Gloomspite Gitz's Shield Squad, it will contain two spider riders together with a final stabber with poken stick. Up next is the Sylvaneth warband. Now, as I've alluded to a bit before, this warband will be a dryad spam. And so for their hammer squad, it will contain four dryads. In the dagger squad, we will once again find the warband's leader, this time a branch witch, together with three more dryads. And lastly, in the shield squad, there will be three more dryads together with a branch nymph. Now, personally, I have a bit of a hard time distinguishing the branch nymph from the dryads. Uh, there are some differences like the face and the arms. But the easiest way to identify her is the fact that she has a skeleton in her branches and none of the dryads do. So if you also have a hard time identifying her, just focus on this detail, as it does make her stick out a lot more from the rest. With the warbands introduced though, let's draw some cards. As the terrain will be custom, I won't be drawing a card for today, but I will just briefly show a top down of what the terrain for today will be looking like. I tried to use as much as the terrain set as possible, giving the impression of a somewhat dense woodland clearing. As for deployment, I pull first blood, now rolling off, the brown dice being the Gloomspike Gits and the blue dice being the Sylvaneth, the Gloomspike Gits win and they pick to be the red deployment zone. As for the victory condition, I pull Defend Defined. This card also calls for a roll off and this time the Gloomspike Gits once again win. And with this roll off, they get to decide whether they want to be the attacker or the defender. They will choose to be the defender, meaning they get to set up 4 treasures in close proximity and they will have to defend it for the rest of the battle. If at the end of a battle round the Dryads are carrying all 4 of the treasures, they will win. Otherwise the Gloomspike Gits will win at the end of turn 4. Naturally they decide to set up their treasures where their dagger squad will deploy. Since this is their only squad at the start of the battle, they will have to put it here to keep it defended. And for the twist, I pull Winds of Fate, which gives an extra initiative dice to each warband, meaning I'll be rolling with 7 dice per warband today. So with the warbands introduced and the cards pulled, let's set up the fighters and get right into turn 1 initiative. Starting with the Gloomspike Gits, they roll 2 doubles and 3 singles. The Sylvaneth then roll a triple and a double. In the end, both warbands decide to hold off on using any wild dice, meaning the Gloomspike Gits will go first. They will however play defensively and make one of their stabbers with Pokin Stick use the wait action. The Branch Witch will then use the Rush ability to move 6 inches over towards the Gobos and then uses a ranged spell attack in order to try and take one of these stabbers out. Hitting on 5s though, she sadly deals no damage, ending her turn. Another Stabba with Poken Stick then uses the wait action. Another Dryad will then use the Rush ability in order to get as close as possible, but staying just out of range of the Gobos to use the Pile In reaction ability. Now that one of the Dryads has gotten close, one of the Stabbas with Poken Stick is going to move into Spear range and then try to attack this Dryad. As they are within 1 inch of a friend, they will use the Backstabbing Mob double ability, giving them plus 1 to strength and attacks. So hitting on 4s rather than 5s, they will score 1 hit, dealing a single point of damage. Another Dryad then simply double moves as far as they can towards the conflict. A Stabber with Pokin Stick that had previously waited then uses their remaining action to move over. After which the final Dryad of the group will follow the example of the previous one and simply move as close as they can. With all the Sylvaneth now having taken their turn, 
the stabber with poke in the stick that also waited before is going to move up and after which the loon boss gets the opportunity to move and attack as well for this they will also use the backstabbing mob ability and with two crits they will deal eight damage ending their turn and that will conclude battle round one all in all i think the goblins have done well holding their ground so far and the loon boss in particular definitely dished out quite some damage already but as the shield squads are gonna come in next turn their reinforcements are far away and the dryads are right in their flank so time will tell how long they can still hold so without further ado let's put the shield squads on the board and get straight into battle round two the gloom spike gets roll three doubles and a single the Sylvaneth then roll two triples and a single as well. The Gloom Spike Gits will use one wild dice to claim initiative, whereas the Sylvaneth will use one of theirs to turn one of their triples into a quad. So the first activation for the Gloom Spike Gits will be a Stabber with Pokin Stick. He will use the double ability backstabbing mob and try to finish off the Dryad which only has one health point remaining. So hitting on 4s due to the bonus strength, they will score 1 hit finishing off the fighter. This still leaves them with 1 action remaining and they will use it to attack the other dryad in range. And this time they score 2 hits, dealing a total of 2 damage. Up next is the branch witch and before she does anything else she will use a quad to use the envoy of the ever queen ability. As the ability value is 6, this will add a 3 to both the toughness and strength characteristics of all friendly fighters within 6 inches. Having done this, she will move over to the loon boss and try to smack him. So now hitting on 3s due to the lovely strength bonus, she will deal 3 damage, ending her turn. A stabber with poking stick is then going to use 1 action to attack the branch witch. And hitting on 5s, he manages 1 crit, dealing a total of 4 damage. After which, he will use his remaining action to try and get into the path towards the treasures for the Dryads. Now that the path is blocked, the Sylvaneth will do a slight change of plans. Activating one of their Dryads in the center of the conflict, they will use the triple ability and Rapturing Song to make sure they get some extra attacks against the Loon Boss. This isn't going to benefit the current Dryad, however, as she will move up and try to attack the top goblin. With only 6 health, she would easily be able to take the Stabba out with a bit of luck, but unfortunately hitting on 3s, she only scores 2 hits, dealing 2 damage. That very Gobbo is then going to immediately retaliate using the backstabbing mob ability as well. Sadly, the strength bonus won't be of use here due to the ridiculous toughness of 6 that all the Dryads have now because of the Envoy of the Everqueen ability. In any case, hoping for 5s and lucky 6s. With 2 attack actions, he sadly only scores 1 hit, dealing 1 damage. The Branch Nymph will then be the first to move into range with the Loon Boss and try and strike him down. She will get an additional attack dice due to the Enrapturing Song ability being used earlier. And hitting on 3s, she rolls 4 ones and only 1 5, dealing 2 damage. Really not what the Sylvaneth were hoping for here. The Loon Boss then decides that getting rid of the Nymph might be the best course of action, and so also using the backstabbing mob ability, he will be attacking with 10 dice total. And hitting on 5s, he manages to score 1 hit and 3 crits. Dealing 14 damage, which is 1 damage short of taking out the fighter. Another Dryad then attempts to take out the previously damaged Stabber with Pokin Stick, hoping to do it in one activation so they can still get a treasure as well. So, hitting on 3s, the first attack yields 1 hit, dealing 1 damage, which sadly means the second activation will have to be used for an attack as well. But at the very least, this one does take out the Stabber. It is then one of the reinforcing spider riders decides to come on over and still have an action left to attack. Unfortunately for him though, since the dryads are all toughened up, he manages to deal no damage. Another dryad then moves into melee range with the loon boss and tries to attack him as well. The crit draught for the dryads continues as this one manages to do 2 damage in total. Another spider rider then takes a double move action to position themselves on top of the treasure. To speed things up a little, I'll then also move the reinforcing stabber. 
And afterwards, the two remaining Dryads will move into melee range with the Stabba that was blocking the way. One of the Dryads then tries to take the Stabba out. And finally, they score a crit and two hits, which is enough to take him out in one attack action. The other Dryad, still having an action remaining, then decides to target the Spider Rider. Here they also find a crit and a hit, dealing a total of 6 damage. And that will be the end of the second turn. I'd say the Dryads are definitely starting to gain some momentum, but I am wondering whether this will be enough. Their reinforcements are quite far away, and the reinforcements of the Gloomspike Gits, containing the Rocket Trogoth, are really close. I think the Sylvaneth have enough force still to sweep over the remaining Gloomspike Gits' dagger squad, but the question then really remains whether after that engagement they will still have enough fighters left to take all of the treasure tokens. Uh, I think it's going to be a close one, I don't know. With at least two turns remaining, let's put the last squad of both warbands on the board and get straight into battle round 3. So, starting off with the Gobbos, they will roll one triple and two doubles. As for the Sylvaneff, they will roll three doubles and a single. The Gloomspike Gits then use one of their wild dice to claim initiative and another to make a quad. The Sylvaneff respond by taking initiative back with one of their wild dice and saving the other in case they need it in turn four. The first activation will then go to the Branch Nymph, who will use the Onslaught ability to try and finish off the Loon Boss. Hitting on 4, she will need to do 9 damage to get it done. In the end, she will roll 2 crits and 2 hits, dealing a total of 12 damage, which takes him out. She will use her remaining action to move up and grab a treasure. I then cheat by accident by making the Branch Witch activate before any Gobbos do. Sorry about that. Um, luckily though, it didn't have many implications for the game, as she uh, tries to attack the Stabber with Poking Stick. And with two attack actions, she only manages to do one crit, dealing four damage. A stabber with poking stick then tries to get the Kaling Blow on the Branch Nymph. He will only need to do one damage, and hitting on fives, he manages to do so, finishing her off. With his remaining action, he then turns to another Dryad and tries to do some good damage as well. However, this time he rolls Snake Eyes, ending his turn. The Dryad then immediately retaliates, and she only needs to deal 2 damage, which she easily accomplishes within one attack action with a crit. Her remaining action, she will move and grab another treasure. Before then ending her turn, she will use the Draw from the Spirit Song ability to also heal herself back up to full. It is then that the dreaded Rocket Trogoth activates and starts causing some mayhem. He will use the Rampage ability, giving him a free 5 inch move, and afterwards will start pummeling the two Dryads in front of him. Hitting on 3s, the first attack deals 6 damage. Another attack yields him 6 more damage, which is enough to fell one of the Dryads. This still leaves him with one bonus attack action though, and so hitting the other Dryad with this, he rolls a crit and 2 hits, dealing a total of 12 damage, taking out yet another fighter. After which, a Dryad will move into melee range with one of the Spider Riders while also snatching the treasure from under his feet. After which, she will also claw him up for good measure. Hitting on fives though, she only manages one hit, dealing one damage. This ends her activation, giving the Sylvaneth control over two out of four treasures already. The other Spider Rider then uses Onslaught to do his absolute best to take out the Dryad in front of him. Hitting on 4s, he will do 2 damage in the first attack and 2 more damage in the second attack, dealing a total of 4 damage, ending his turn without the kill. This Dryad then immediately uses the Draw from the Spirit Song ability, healing all of her wounds. After which, she disengages, grabs a treasure and retreats to the rest of her warband. This will be the last Dryad activation of consequence, and so a bunch of Gloomspike Gits will now all activate at the same time for the sake of speed. Starting with two Shooters, they will just double move to try and get into the action of things. The Spider Rider then tries to do good damage to the Dryad in front of him. Hitting on fours, he will do five damage on his first attack, and on his second attack, he does a solid ten more, completely overkilling the Dryad. Then there is still one Stabber with Poking Stick chilling in the back. He will move into melee range with the Dryad and try to poke her. But hitting on fives, he deals no damage. 
The last fighters to then be activated still will be the Sylvaneth's Hammer Squad. Their activation won't be very complicated as they will all double move towards the action. And this will mark the end of Battle Round 3. As for the next battle round, things could be over pretty quick if the Gloomspike Gits get the initiative. If this happens, they will be able to position one of their fighters in such a way that there is no way for the Sylvaneth to grab the last treasure still. In addition to this, by the looks of things now, the only fighter capable of grabbing that treasure completely surrounded by Gits would be the Branch Witch. Now, seeing the amount of fighters surrounding that treasure, together with the Rock Cut Trogoth only one move action away, one can ponder if the Branch Witch will survive this engagement, if she does decide to grab this treasure. In any case, this really is pretty much the only thing the Sylvaneth can do, and so let's see how it pans out in the next battle round. Starting with the Gloops by Gits, they will roll two doubles and three singles. The Sylvaneth then roll a triple and a double. The Sylvaneth then use all of their wild dice to claim initiative, and the Gloom Spike Gits will use theirs to turn one of their doubles into a triple. This will then give the first activation to the Branch Witch. She will move over to the treasure and then try to take out one of the Shootas. Hitting on fours, she'll just do one damage. Before ending her turn though, she will use the triple ability Inspiring Presence to activate another fighter. Now admittedly, I did pick a fighter here that is more than 6 inches away from the Branch Witch by mistake. If you're interested in how much this mattered for the outcome of the battle, I will discuss it at the end of the video. In any case, I chose to activate one of the Dryads all the way in the back and made her use a double for a rush ability to get over and grab the last treasure. This puts the Gits in a pretty tense position as the Sylvaneth now have all of the treasures. If they don't manage to do something before the end of the turn, they'll lose. And so they will send one of their spider riders into a treasure carrying dryad. Now the chances of a kill here are next to none, but hitting on fours, he'll at least manage to deal 5 damage still. The main purpose here after all was locking that dryad down. Another treasure carrying dryad then turns around to try and take down the stabber with poke and stick before he can act. Hitting on fives, the first attack scores only one hit and the second attack scores none, dealing negligible damage even from the perspective of a grot. This very Stabba will then use the Onslaught ability to try and get the drop on this Dryad. As this Dryad is more than 10 inches away from the other unactivated Dryads, the treasure she holds could not be recovered meaning that a few lucky crits here could just end the game for the Sylvaneth. So hitting on fours, on the first attack the Stabba will score two hits, and on the second he will just score another hit. So no victory for the Gits just yet. As the remaining Dryads have no way to either get to a treasure or attack an enemy of significance right now, I will move straight to the quote unquote survival round of the Branch Witch, as she will be attacked by a Spider Rider, two Shootas, and even the rocket Trogoth. They will have a total of 16 health to get through, so let's see if they can get it done and win the game. Starting with the Spider Rider, they will use the Spider Bite ability, and so because the ability value is 5, they will get to roll 5 dice, and on every 4 or up, it will deal 3 damage. With only a single 6 though, the ability will deal 3 damage. The Spider Rider himself then tries to follow it up with an attack, but with 2 attack actions, manages to score no hits, it is then up to the Shooters to adequately soften up the Branch Witch before the troll arrives. Hitting on fives, the first one manages to score only one hit, whereas the second manages to get a crit and a hit, dealing a grand total of four damage. Not looking too good. This means that the Trogoth will need to do nine damage with one attack action, as he will use his first action to move on over. Hitting on threes, he'll need a crit and a hit to get it done. And he rolls exactly that. One crit, one hit, dealing 9 damage, killing the Branch Witch, and ending the game. Because with no way to retrieve this last treasure, victory will go to the Gloomspike Gits. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this first battle on some non-Warcry terrain. If you want to see more of this terrain set, or other stuff from Dungeons & Lasers, or another company, or whatever, let me know. 
Now, as promised, I still wanted to quickly look at that scenario with the inspiring presence, because while that move was not legal, I think there's something equal they could have done had I not forgotten about the range of inspiring presence. So, looking at the situation again, instead of activating that one dryad, the branch witch will use her inspiring presence to activate the dryad next to her with a treasure. This dryad would then use her first action to drop the treasure, and then the second action to move over to the spider rider to tie him down. After which, the smartest response of the gloom spy gets, I believe, would be to disengage with the spider rider and then try to position him in a way that the dryad would not be able to get to the drop treasure. But seeing how the dryads would still have access to the rush ability at this point, I don't think I could have positioned him in a way that they would not be able to get to the treasure at all. Thus, the final outcome would have been the same as what happened now. Now, as much as I dislike that I didn't do this in the video itself, it's sadly one of the consequences of trying to film these videos alone. With no one in the room to make sure that I don't cheat, it's very easy to overlook a rule sometimes, and as much as I can try to prevent it myself, something like this will happen occasionally. Now, with that said, if you enjoy the videos and would like to support the channel, you can just like, subscribe, share it with friends, all that jazz. All of that helps the algorithm pick up my videos and hopefully show it to more people who like Warcry, so that would be pretty neat. And if you would want to support more directly, you could make a small donation on my Ko-fi, which I'll use to get more warbands, more terrain, more stuff for the channel essentially. So with that said, thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next Warcry Battle Report.